I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is John Fennick, Portfolio Manager and Consultant at Fennick Consulting. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great to see you as usual. Likewise, Charlotte. Thanks for having me. Really good to be checking back in with you, and we're picking up on a conversation that we had back in May. When we were speaking at that point, gold was still above 2000, but you told us that a pullback to 1900 wouldn't be a surprise, and it might even be welcome in terms of consolidation. So just this week, we've seen gold get back down to that 1900 level, and I'm curious to know what you see coming in the next couple of months, especially given that we're entering the summer period, which tends to be a little bit slower. Yeah, great question. So when you and I interviewed in Vancouver uh, in January, I mentioned that gold would probably bounce off of that 1790 to 1800 level. I mentioned that as support again on one of your other shows, and that has held. So if you remember in January, I think we got between 1810, 1820, yeah. and it bounced a couple of times off of that, and then it went all the way to 2000 plus, right? So uh, technical you know, analysis to us is extremely important, and we use it in every thing that we do. We like to combine that with fundamental analysis, right? Um, but technicals are what we look at first, and that's kind of why, because a lot of big traders look at technicals. Um, so yes, we said 1900 would be revisited. That did happen. Uh, the good news is it bounced back and closed above 1900, which is bullish. But we're still seeing a pretty grim picture in some of these commodities. You know, um, silver ha has held 22, but hasn't really done much. And so that gold to silver ratio right now, you know, is, is at 85, which um, as you, that's just for your listeners edification, that means dividing the price of gold uh, per ounce by the price of silver per ounce. And then that's 85 right now. So when that gets to a 90 ratio or higher, Silver is usually a buy almost every time going back, you know, 30 plus years. So we are keeping a close eye on silver as one of our top five holdings. Um, we like, you know, silver equities if silver does bounce here, of course. And so we're taking, you know, July and August, uh, Charlotte, to kind of position into some names, thinking that we're going to get some type of rally, you know, late August into November. Um, and, and, Summertime is, is and, 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 you know, in, the, in December as well. And when people aren't doing their homework is when we're kind of doing mo most of our work because, um, you know, this is when you can pick up some huge bargains. And then if you feel like, you know, doing something with them and disposing them later, uh, you know, next year, the year after, I mean, you're going to make some considerable money, we think. Okay. And do you think you could talk about the support and resistance levels that you see for gold and silver? Because I think it's always helpful to line up that range that we might see. Sure. So currently, I would say that 1790 to 1800 is still a line in the sand for me. I want to make sure that we hold that, that strong support. Um, the next support level for us would be somewhere around, you know, 1820 to 1865. Um, that, that area should hold um and then you know we we violated 1900 to the downside so that was something people were looking for again an intraday violation like that to us once or twice isn't the end of the world um i think gold when you look at the entire picture and look at all commodities and look at how well it's traded i think that's the takeaway is that gold is holding in there and you look at what's happened with the russian disruption and that kind of outside event as we will call it is giving wealthy people more reason to buy gold, right? Like, I mean, that it was not expected, right? That happened Friday after market, lasted a lot of the weekend, and then by Monday there was a resolution, right? But what if there wasn't a resolution? What if we're still dealing with that today? It's like, these are the kind of things that um, are, are not givens in the market. The market, you know, is, is um, going to do its own thing, and so you have to pay attention. Definitely, it's really important to pay attention, and Let's talk about some of the factors that are important for gold as well as silver right now. Before we turn the camera on, we were discussing GDP. You are mentioning that it came in much stronger than anticipated. So let's go over that and what you're seeing in the markets as a result. Sure. So the estimate was a rise of 1.3% and we got a 2% reading, which is very hot. Um, a hot GDP rating is what uh, reading is what drove gold and silver much lower pre-market, but then they both recovered. Uh, by the end of the day, which is bullish. Um, I think, you know, this for us cements a 
another 25 basis point hike, which we can get into in a few minutes with the Fed on uh, July 26th. And um, uh, the only thing that could change that is July 12th CPI reading, if that was wonky. But I don't think that, you know, given the Fed's comments, we'd have to see a really low CPI read to get the Fed to reconsider a 25 basis point hike. There's a great tool that we've talked about on your show before that I think people should take a look at, and that's called the CME Fed Watch Tool. So it stands for uh, CME is just Charlie Mary Edward, you know, Fed Watch Tool. You Google search that, and it'll show you with what probability the next rate hike would be, right? If it's going to be, you know, 30%, 50%. Right now, it's 89.3% of a hike following the GDP. Uh, read and that was at seventy four percent just last week. So you're getting you know closer to uh, a definite you know if you will like like just looking back at our June meeting there was a ninety seven percent probability of a pause. So we went into that meeting knowing that the Fed was likely going to pause. But then what did Powell say in in the press conference? Right, that's what's really important to us, important to a lot of you know shops that look at that kind of stuff to to read the tea leaves. Right. And thinking about what he did say, I believe that what he's indicated is that we'll get probably two more hikes in 2023 is what it's sounding like. And so what do you see coming? Again, keeping in mind that as we've discussed before, it kind of is a little bit difficult right now to go beyond one meeting when you're making your predictions. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. He said two more hikes, but also he said not a single voting member was on board with a Fed rate cut. And we have been on your show now for probably two years, and we've said on every single show, unlike every single of our single one of our peers, except maybe two that I can think of, that basically we're calling for Fed cuts as early as September of last year. Again, like I would love to see that. I'm in gold and silver, right? Fed cuts rates, we're going to make a lot of money with the names we're in right now. But that doesn't mean we have to just talk our book and tell people, hey, you should be thinking about Fed cut because it's not happening, right? We have we've seen it play out now. Um, now, if the Fed has told you for two straight meetings in May and in June that there's been not a single person willing to, to cut rates, you, you know, as an investor, you have to look at that and say, well, maybe I'm wrong. Like I have to look, I do some do some work on my holdings and, and see what I can do to position for maybe a different outcome, right? Maybe that to us looks like you know, a recession later in the year or into next year, as opposed to right now, because of the data, right? When you see a GDP rate of 2%, if you're thinking recession this summer, you're rethinking that. You're like, well, that's a pretty strong read. Like, you know, you look at not far payrolls, the payrolls numbers have been strong, not weak. That's another reason that we're not getting a recession right now, right? So look, I, I, I said this publicly and I believe it. We will be in a recession. It's just, you know, you have to be pragmatic about it and look at, you know, your you know, the data as the Fed does. And and it's a you know, it's a fluid situation. Right. So these are all really important things to be watching when it comes to the precious metals. I wonder what other elements you're looking at right now that you think investors should pay attention to. And again, of course, there are many, many, many things out there that you could be keeping an eye on. Well, you know, we mark our calendars. We tell our clients and our newsletter follow, you know, followers, hey, you have to mark calendars and be on top of stuff so you don't wake up with a surprise. And and GDP is something we look at every month. We look at CPI. We look at non-farm payrolls. We look at ISM. Um, those are some of our big ones. And we have other smaller ones like, you know, watching real estate, watching for a housing disruption one way or the other, right? Um, but, you know, there's, there's a, a ton of data to look at. Um, that's why our website homepage says a tidal wave of information is upon us because that's how I feel. You know, it's, it's like there's clients are getting hit from every angle of news right now, right? It's like, everyone's got a smartphone. Everyone's got, you know, social media, everyone's got this stuff that 10, 20 years ago you didn't have. So you've got all this stuff coming to you and it gets confusing. You know, uh, even my smartest clients sometimes are overwhelmed, right? And so it's 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 natural to feel that way. But then you have to figure out a plan, and um, and I think most clients uh, get get paralyzed sometimes and don't do anything. And that's not a strategy. You have to kind of figure, okay, I'm going to listen to John on Charlotte's show. I'm going to listen to this guy. I'm going to listen to this woman. I'm going to listen to the Fed. I'm going to listen to CNBC. It's like there's there's five things right there. That's a lot. 
And so, you know, it, it, you have to kind of keep it, you know, to three to five as opposed to 20, because when you start listening to 20 things, I find most clients don't do anything and that's, that's not good either. All right. And let's move over to looking at what you're doing. We always like to get an update from you on the companies that we've spoken about previously. And I know that some of them have had news developments that you have been watching. So let's hear about that if we don't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, so Ascendant Resources, ASDRF, um, invited me to a due diligence trip at full disclosure. So I, I'm going to visit them in Portugal in September. I think that's September 7th to be exact. So I'll report back. Uh, with what I see there, but this is only the second trip I've taken in my entire career. Um, I'm not the type to leave the computer much, so hopefully your listeners will get a feel for the fact that I, you know, I'm investing that kind of time to go out there and I, I take it seriously. Um, the only other site visit I've ever done was at U.S. Gold in Wyoming, uh, and that's USAU, and that was two summers ago. Um, USAU actually just got upgraded. Um, by HC Wainwright from ten fifty to twelve dollars, you know they basically kept their uh, their uh, their buy target, but the stock kind of responded to that. It went from four dollars to kind of where we mentioned it on your show last time to about four seventy, and it's around four thirty five right now. So we we still like USAU a lot. It's a Nasdaq traded gold stock, very liquid. Um, Let's see. Um, other news. Okay, yeah, we've had news in Canadian Critical since we last met. That's R I I N F. I would encourage people to go to their website. That's the former Braveheart. Um, I really like Ian Burzens as a leader. You know, he ran a company called Thompson Creek, which got bought by Centera um, probably about six, seven years ago. And so, one of my strategies is always to follow people to their next thing. Right? If I was a Thompson shareholder as I was, they made me a lot of money. Well then, hey, I'm going to follow him to his next thing, and this is his next company. And so, when you look at their news flow, it's been very active, it's been very positive, but the stock has yet to respond. Why is that? Well, sometimes it's just because of the market we're in, Charlotte. You know, it's it's sort of a lack of interest right now. So, as a value manager, those are the kind of things I look at. Okay, good news flow, good leader, and Ian. Um, if you believe in copper and 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 gold, you know, it, taking a turn for the better down the road, this is the time to buy a company like that, in our opinion. Um, trying to think of, oh yes, so Stillwater, which is uh, PGEZF, that had major news uh, that they were getting a 9.9% .9 investment from Glencore. Uh, Glencore is one of the biggest commodities players in the world. Um, they are in Montana, um, great jurisdiction. I've, I've owned two different stocks outside of Stillwater in that region over the last 10 years, very close by. So I know that area very well, and uh, I think Mike's doing a good job of you know leading the company there. So we continue to be shareholders there. Um, do you want me to give you a few new names because those are kind of you know what we talked about last time? Yes, yes, I think that would be appreciated. Okay, so one new one. You know, I'm not jumping on the lithium bandwagon very hard because I think a lot of that stuff is promotion um, and not really like do these people have real assets near real players, right? But if you look at this little company called Spark um, Energy, which is M-T-E-H-F in the States, um, they are uh, putting out regular news flow almost every two weeks, it seems, um, and have a decent land package in Brazil um, that is really, really close to some major companies like Sigma, Atlas and some other big players. And so that's what we look for is like, why is the market not picking this up, right? Like they're going to chase the big boys, but they're not going to even touch the little guys sometimes. You know, that's true of gold too, right? When we saw gold run, a lot of gold juniors didn't even move much. Um, so as longer term investors in something like gold or even lithium, we're going to look for value like Spark and say, okay, at some point, someone's going to recognize this. And there's going to be some value there. And I'll give you another example of that. On our sh on your show uh, last year, we talked a lot about Idaho Champion, if you remember. Um, that one is GLDRF. And I put my money where my mouth was in the fall. And I bought over a million shares at three cents, um, just out there every single day, buying 10,000, 50,000 to not move the market. But then now it's trading at 14 cents, right? So nothing has changed except the fact that they've acquired more land and they're starting to, to drill that land, right? They've raised money. They've done everything correct. Um, but 
again, taking a stock from three to 14 is a significant move. And we made shareholders a lot of money in a name like that. And I, I can't really compare Spark to Idaho, but I think that, and by the way, Idaho Champion changed its name to Champion Electric. But um, I think, you know, you see similarities there, right? You're acquiring a large land package in a good jurisdiction. There are a lot of majors around. Uh, if you look at Champion you know, where they're positioned, they're like directly next to Patriot, which is one of the best, you know, mining stocks in the last couple of years, PMET. So, um, you know, we look for stuff like that proximity, right? We like proximity plays. Um, we mentioned this on your show probably six months ago, but World Copper has barely moved. Um, symbol is WCUFF. Uh, I just met with Nolan last week and, you know, they're cashed up for the whole year, which I think the market is missing. Um, juniors continually have to raise money, as we said in our last show. But you also look for when someone's cashed up and say, wow, that's... That's good in this kind of a market. You don't have to raise any more money. Um, they have two properties, one in Arizona, one in Chile. Both are advanced stage properties. And so, again, at 11 cents, we think both of those projects are worth 11 cents um, by themselves. So, you know, we're not looking for, as some of these guys call, 10 baggers, you know, eight baggers. We, we, we're looking for, you know, a single or a double in, in a lot of the names we buy. And buying something cheap like that that's cashed up. We just think that at some point, you know, Chile being the number one producer of copper in the world, Arizona being a fantastic jurisdiction here where I live, um, someone's going to pay attention to the company, right? So we, we're just patient value investors and like what they're doing. Um, let's see if I can come up with, yeah, one more. So we talked about, you know, kind of on the negative side, but also uh, with a positive spin. You know, Palladium is something I mentioned on your show. I used to write on Palladium for Sprott. Palladium's been in a serious downturn here, and I, I mean, it is getting heavily shorted as a commodity. It's it's easy to move, um, but Canadian Palladium is sort of pivoting and repositioning themselves as an energy metals type play. They have a project that's in Europe, and they basically have a, a, a CEO in Wayne Tisdale who's got a lot of experience in cobalt. So that deposit, um, which is on the Czech border there, basically is copper and cobalt so they've gotten a grant from the uh, european union to um, help with funding that project and uh, we think they're going to get additional grants they've applied for those but to be one of three companies that got any grants uh you know from the eu is pretty special in a market that's not really rewarding juniors so we continue to hold our position there too Okay, that was great. I know that everybody always appreciates getting actual names to look at. And as usual, we'll make sure to leave them in a comment or in the video description so that everybody can see the names and tickers. I have a couple of questions for you on the educational side. And one of them is about, as you're talking about here, you're looking for a single or a double, you might be looking for something higher. I wondered if you can explain how you decide what you're looking for, because I think investors often hear that they need to have a goal. So they expect the company to do X and Y, the return should be Z, but how do you actually make that calculation? Yeah, it is tricky. Um, as I mentioned on your show before, I worked with financial advisors in the US for my entire career before starting my company. And in doing so, I found that many smart financial advisors have made their money for clients through bonds, through tech stocks, through healthcare stocks, through real estate. You know. Um, they haven't made it through mining stocks. And so, you know, you kind of have to augment your relationship with a financial advisor with someone like me or someone else like me, right? Like, I mean, you need to subscribe to a newsletter or watch some professionals that do this for a living. This is what I do for a living, right? Like, I mean, and, and paying for information is okay because the advisor that you're going to go to 99% of the time, at least in the U.S., doesn't have the expertise to help you in, in this sector. They can help you with many other things. They're not going to help you with this. And so what I would say is you have to come up with a game plan of um, how much money do I have? How much money of that can I put at risk at all? And then how much of that would go with my financial advisor and how much of that should be invested in something like commodities, right? Because that's another discussion. It's 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 a risky sector it's full of of hiccups along the way but i think if you 
have a plan for your core assets, for your core real estate, for your core bonds over here with your advisor, and then say, okay, well, I'm going to take 10% of this and put it into commodities because I believe in this story going forward, right? An impetus for that might be the financial crisis you and I talked about last time. Um, because March 8th for me was pretty meaningful, right? When you start seeing large institutions fold, um, some of them on weekends, that's a wake-up call. And if it wasn't a wake-up call then, it should be now because there may be more of those. Um, you and I talked about Jamie Dimon, who you know talked about this in his newsletter to shareholders. So when you see the largest U.S. bank writing about this in a quarterly newsletter, like, you know, they're taking it seriously. And Jamie was saying that he sees more crisis on the horizon. Have we seen that yet? No. But that, that, that doesn't mean it's not right around the corner, right? I mean, it's, it's possible. So I think you have to be more aware of things as a client right now um, because we're in so deep into a bull run, right? March of 2009 was the beginning. We're 14 plus years in. So show me another time in the last hundred years this has happened. The answer is never. <laughs> so, you know, you, you have to be like, okay, um, I've made a lot of money. Look at my 401k balance. Congratulations to me. But then, hey, I need to be more prudent with thinking about the next 14 years because it's going to be way different. Very true. Very true. And the other thing that I wanted to pull on that you were talking about was investor sentiment right now, which in the resource sector maybe quite low. And as we've been saying, we're going into the summer. I think that everyone's heard that old adage of, you know, sell in May and go away. want to ask you about that. Not necessarily, I don't think, of course, that you're selling everything for the summer and coming back. But do you take seasonality into account when you're managing your portfolio? And you have to take it into account when you're looking at mining stocks too, because Imagine investing in somewhere like a very cold region, right? You're not going to drill 12 months out of the year. Um, so news flow will be somewhat limited, right? Not to say that you shouldn't invest in that area, but you just have to go in with your eyes open, right? Um, and seasonality in gold and silver, it, 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 it is a factor. But, uh, um, January through April is generally a really good time. Um, I, I would argue... September, October, November is generally a good time. And there's a lot of mining conferences that happen September, October, November. So a lot of companies will go out and present to wealthy people and institutions and analysts. And I think that's, you know, why we spend a lot of time at our computer between July and August and in December when it's it's hard to be away from family. Like, you know, in December when it's my birthday and it's the holidays and then my little girl's running around, I want to be with everyone. But it's like, that's when I can make a lot of money Going into next year when the euphoric kind of, you know, tick happens. Look at what happened this year, Charlotte. We saw that again. There was a nice run in there between January and April, right? I mean, we really saw gold take off and a lot of stocks did respond. But if you bought them in November, December, like we were talking about with Champion Electric, right? Buy it at three cents. It's at 14 cents now. You can do whatever you want. I mean, if you need to sell some, you can sell some at a 400% profit. So it's, it's like, yeah, a seasonality definitely does matter. Okay, well, thank you for going into that. I also think it's important to look at. That's everything for me today, but I did want to open up the floor in case you had any points to add, things that are on your mind that you want investors to know about right now. Sure, I'll just leave one, uh, two things. Uh, one is, you know, we take this very seriously. This is what we do for a living, right? So it's not free, but I'm willing to work with people based on their budget. So in the scenario that you gave us uh, that we just laid out for, for your listeners, right? Where you, you talk to your financial advisor or whoever you trust with your real money, right? And you say, I, I want to take X amount of dollars and invest it in this sector, but it's not going to be a million. It's not going to be half a million. It's going to be X. Well, you know, contact me and I'm, I'm happy to try to work with you on some type of service that we can provide um, that would fit your budget, right? I mean, that's kind of where we're at. We want to grow with people now rather than growing with them when things take off, because I'm not going to have that kind of time uh, at that point. I mean, just to let you know, in April and May of this year, we had our biggest subscriber growth ever because I talked a lot about the financials, right? Because I came from that world and we were talking about the, the troubles of Credit Suisse oh, back sure. in September of last year. You know, it's like yeah. I used to work there. So I have different perspective than some mining people in, in, in this industry. Um, 
And I think that if you have serious money, you really need to be thinking about putting some of it in our sector now. There's never a perfect time. It's just a matter of, you know, contacting me or someone else and trying to get started. That's number one. Number two would be the BRICS meeting that's coming up. That's uh, That stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. That meeting is coming up August 22nd through the 24th. Uh, I think that you could see uh, an announcement there on an alternative currency and how that alternative currency plays out is to be seen. But what if it were backed by gold, silver, oil, right? It's like that would wake some people up and I think also drop the U.S. dollar. And that would be anytime you see a significant drop in the U.S. dollar, it's a, it's a positive for mining and mining stocks, right? Almost every time. So we're positioning ahead of that meeting, you know, to two months from now to to kind of say, OK, Let's put some positions on now with the idea that that could be a catalyst for something that sends us into a, bra a rally into September. All right. I think that is a great place to wrap up. Thank you for highlighting those two last points. We'll have you back after that BRICS meeting because I think that will be very interesting to look at. And it's a topic that we have been following for the last little while. So thank you so much for coming on to talk right now. It's great to have you as usual. Thanks a lot, Charlotte. Great. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is John. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.